Angie, what what happened? What, what do you mean what happened? The stuff in my office? What is all of this stuff? We're getting ready for harvest and you had that huge open space so we wanted to lay out some of the backdrops. You know, it's all for harvest. It's like a month. It'll only be in there for like a month-ish. Harvest is really close. We are a few weeks into our series, Counterproductive Community, and as a fellowship of believers, we are called to live in community with one another. Uh, but sometimes, what we do can be counterproductive to doing so. Instead of being there for each other when we need each other, we find ourselves doing a number of other things that disrupt unity in the church. This fall, we're diving into issues that have been uh, affecting the church since its inception. And our hope is that we can find conviction where needed and also uh, learn how to avoid what is counterproductive to building community. Each week we're going to be turning to uh, a passage in one of the epistles, of Paul's epistles, to address something that is counterproductive to building community, and then hopefully find uh, how we're called to live instead. When I was in college, I had the privilege of being an RA for two years. Uh, RA stands for residential assistant, for those that don't know, and being an RA, it was my job to make sure students felt a sense of community, uh, that, I was, that activities were planned, and ultimately that the rules of campus would be followed, which anyone who's ever been on a college campus knows that's a, kind of a tough task to do sometimes. So one of the blessings of my job was that I got the opportunity to deal with all of the drama and conflict that ensued between people living in the dorms. And the, the kinds of conflict I would see varied in all different levels of sizes, maturity levels, and especially going to a school in the middle of nowhere, Montana, you got to see some pretty interesting things. I got to be the one who told the football players to turn down their music at midnight because the nursing students were trying to study for an exam. I got to be the one who got chewed out by our janitor, Alan, and he was a character because someone thought it would be funny to leave a little turd in the shower. Sorry if you're offended by the word turd. I got to be the one uh, to tell the diesel mechanic students not to rev their massive truck engines at five in the morning so that people could get sleep. And I got to be the one who confronted my fellow basketball teammates when they thought it would be a good idea to uh, duct tape some tarps in the shower and make a sauna. Now, I'm not going to lie, I may or may not have indulged in it before I corrected them. It was pretty epic. It was awesome. But full transparency, uh, it's hard sometimes when you have to deal with conflict. And I mean, I think the, probably the craziest thing I had to deal with was when someone thought it would be funny to put a dead porcupine in another person's room. I had to be the one to clean up the aftermath in all the different ways. Now, I can look back and laugh at kind of the simple or humorous nature of these conflicts that I just mentioned. But as an RA, I got to experience firsthand how people respond to conflict. And it's not always pretty. I typically saw students deal with it in one of three ways. They ignored it. They escalated it. Or once in a while, they'd try to calm or resolve it. As a pastor in our church, I routinely see conflict dealt with in the same ways. Sometimes over conflict as ridiculous as the stuff I just mentioned. It can sometimes seem easy or convenient, or maybe less work, to ignore conflict and just kind of let it play out. And it can be just as easy to escalate it when that conflict strikes a nerve in us. But when we do that, all we do is continue to cultivate the issue. That's why as followers of Jesus, we are instructed to respond in a way that de-escalates and resolves conflict. We're called to calm conflict, not cultivate it. Our passage today is one that gives us guidance on how we can better calm conflict when it arises in our lives. 
Our scripture for today is found in Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 21. And our scripture reading for this week is Melanie Hilaritis. So Melanie, would you please come forward to the center of the room? And would everyone who's able please rise for the reading of God's word? We always rise and face the center of the room to remind us of the centrality of scripture and how it's to be the primary lens we use to determine how we live. Uh, Melanie, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Thanks, Mel. Uh, you could all be seated, please. So conflict is inevitable. We're all sinners, which means at one point or another, we're all bound to make a mistake. We're bound to act in our own self-interest and potentially offend or wrong another person. In conflict, there's always two sides. There's the person who has wronged and the person who is being wronged. But in the complexity of our sinful nature, it's also possible and very common that we find ourselves on both sides of the equation. We get wronged and we wrong others. In our passage today, Paul presents biblical wisdom on how we can prevent and diffuse conflict in our lives despite the complexity of our sinful nature. He instructs us to calm conflict rather then ignore or escalate it. The first way we're shown to calm conflict comes from the first half of verse 17. It says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. When we feel we've been wronged, it's a natural reaction for us to want to retaliate. Our sinful nature tells us that we're going to feel so much better if we just strike back. But we are called to deny our carnal desire to do so. Paul instructs us to refrain from retaliation. When we refrain from retaliating, we get the opportunity to slow down or stop the escalation of the conflict. It's easier to calm our conflict when we limit the variables within it. Because when we retaliate, we add to and complicate the equation or situation by adding just another layer to it. And sometimes what ends up happening is you start forming these layers and layers and layers and layers of retaliated conflict levels. Paul wants us to refrain from saying and doing anything that could potentially escalate the situation. Proverbs 15.1 says this, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. If we want to live into our calling to calm the conflict in our lives, then we have to start practicing self-control and keep ourselves from doing or saying something to get back at our opposition. For some of us, that might look like keeping both hands on the wheel when someone cuts you off in traffic rather than raising a few fingers. It's opting to not give that last jab or I told you so in your marriage arguments. Or it's making the choice not to make a passive-aggressive social media post when somebody offends you or uninvites you to something. How do you tend to respond when people wrong you? Do you fire back or do you resist the temptation? So as we resist this temptation to reciprocate the hurt that we feel, the second half of verse 17 illuminates how we're called to live into being a follower of Jesus in conflict. It says, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Now, doing what is right in the eyes of everyone is more than just treating others in a way that doesn't offend or maybe adhering to a universal understanding of morality. This is great, but the only issue is that sometimes cultural morality is at odds with biblical morality. Doing what is right in the eyes of everyone 
is living in a way where we're being careful that our conduct does not betray the high standards of morality displayed in the gospel. To both prevent and diffuse conflict, Paul tells us that one of the best things we can do is remain above reproach. Now, living above reproach is doing everything in our power to live the way that God's word commands us to live. It's living a life that reflects the character of the gospel. When we live our lives in this way and respect the people around us, odds are we're going to find ourselves in the midst of less conflict. And when we find ourselves in conflict, we're less likely to compromise our witness as a follower of Jesus. To do what is right in the eyes of everyone means living a way that reflects the truth and morality of the gospel. It's loving like Jesus loves. Forgiving like Jesus forgives. And trying our best to follow God's commands the way Jesus obediently did. But it's also being willing to own our mistakes and repent and apologize when we've wronged someone. When we pursue remaining above reproach in all we do, we proactively calm conflict in our lives and set the groundwork for forgiveness when we eventually do wrong someone else. In our everyday lives and in our conflict, does our, conflict, does our conduct remain above reproach? Are we doing everything we can to be without blame? treating others the way Jesus calls us to. In our pursuit to calm conflict, it's also essential that we reach for peace. Verse 18 says, if it is possible as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. In all we do, we are called to be peacemakers. When we think about what we're saying or doing, are we asking ourselves whether or not those things will push us towards peace with others? Last year, uh, I had an experience uh, that most parents, I think, kind of dread is you get a call from the school or a call from a parent uh, from someone at the school and say, hey, uh, I wanted to talk to you about something your son did. And I'm like, oh no, he got in a fight. What's going to happen? And and they start explaining that uh, one of my son's Uh, witnessed a couple classmates fighting. And in the midst of that fight, he walked up to their little skirmish and he says, hey guys, knock it off. That's enough. You're both pretty. (laughs) Now, as ridiculous as that is, my little dude was being a peacemaker. And that's not something that comes natural to all of us. I think we all like to feel, you know, kind of vindicated or or want to have that revenge exacted. But Jesus calls for us to be peacemakers. Reaching for peace means worrying less about being right and our adversary being wrong and making sure that both sides get what they deserve. It's instead about doing what needs to be done to move forward or restore relationship. And a simple as that little anecdote was about my son, that's what he did in that moment. That's how we're called to live. Paul pushes us to focus less on being right and more on bringing resolution and restoration. But there's a reality that sometimes peace is not mutually attainable, which is why the passage says that we are to live at peace if it is possible as far as it depends on you. As long as we've done everything in our part to create or work towards peace, we don't have to own the weight of the conflict where someone refuses to work towards resolution. This means that when we find ourselves in conflict, maybe with a narcissistic coworker, an abusive family member, a possessive friend that refuses to do anything to help change the unhealthy nature of the relationship, You don't have to feel the guilt and the weight of that conflict, of that relational strife being unresolved. We are instructed to pursue peace, but sometimes peace means having a peace of mind that we did all we could. 
<coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Reaching for peace is doing everything we can to find resolution or restoration. In pursuit of peace, we can sometimes become frustrated with the lack of ownership, remorse, or cooperation of the other people that have wronged us. And that's natural. Because being a peacemaker, reaching for peace, is costly. It can weigh on us. When we feel like we've been taken advantage of, we can easily find ourselves tempted to take vengeance by taking matters into our own hands. But that's not what Paul tells us to do. In verse 19, he says, Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, It is, ta- it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Paul here is quoting Deuteronomy 32, verse 35. This verse comes from a section titled, The Song of Moses. And it's a song that God commanded Moses to recite to the Israelites and have kept with the commandments to serve as a testimony of God's faithfulness. A testament of God's promises. What Paul's communicating here is that it's not our role to take vengeance, but rather trust in God's faithfulness. We shouldn't be taking matters into our own hands when we feel like wrongdoing has gone unpunished or that uh, something has been mishandled. God has promised that his wrath will avenge and repay any wrongdoings on the final day of judgment. Rather than taking revenge on our own terms, Paul instructs us to rely on God's wrath. Now, relying on God's wrath is having a deep trust and reliance on God to be able to address the sin in the world rather than ourselves. When we live into relying on God's wrath, we should find ourselves less preoccupied or worrying about what wrongdoers deserve. I think a lot of us struggle with taking matters into our own hands in vengeance rather than trusting in God's wrath. Have any parents here ever chewed out a coach or opposing player because they treated your child badly? Have any of us ever left someone off of a birthday invitation list because they left you off of theirs? Or have any of us ever gotten into a fight because someone said or did something to one of our friends or family that we didn't like? Obviously, there are times where we must take initiative for justice to be served. In fact, Scripture says that we are to seek justice. But when we take matters into our own hands and turn our justice into a spirit of vengeance, we fail to live into our calling to calm the conflict. When we feel like we've been wronged or that the situation wasn't handled right, rather than taking matters into our own hands, we have to be willing to place it before the Lord. Let his wrath do the damage. We have to remember that the situation will one day be handled by the ultimate judge in Jesus Christ. And that the wrath and justice of God will address the issue in a greater way than we ever could. And so will God's grace. Rather than responding to the conflict in our lives with vengeance, Paul tells us to respond to evil with good. Verse 20 and 21 says, On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him some drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We are to meet the wrong done against us with good deeds. When the person that has wronged us continues to treat us the way we don't deserve, we are instructed to respond with kindness. And this kindness shouldn't be inauthentic or intended to make them angry or prove a point, but rather an attempt to soften the heart of the person we have conflict with, to extend a branch of peace, to bless them. Responding with good deeds to the evil ones done against us displays our longing for peace and restoration. 
and it displays the transformational work of Jesus in our lives. It's one thing not to retaliate or to take revenge, but are we being intentional? Are we being intentional that when we're wronged or offended, responding by doing something thoughtful or kind to the people who hurt us? Are we bringing coffee to that coworker who is critical and disrespectful to us? Are we still sending that happy birthday text to the friend we thought betrayed us? Are we still inviting all of our family members to the family dinners when there's unresolved strife and dysfunction? One of the greatest witnesses we will ever have is the way that we handle conflict. When we respond to evil with good, it communicates that we're not going to let our sinful nature be what directs us, but rather our devotion to Jesus and his teachings. We are instructed not to respond to evil with good, but so often we find ourselves doing the opposite. In what way might God be challenging us to overcome evil with good in a relationship filled with conflict right now? To calm the conflict in our lives, our end game needs to be peace and resolution rather than vindication and restitution. As we address or try to resolve our conflicts, it's critical that we take a posture that calms and de-escalates the situation, eases the tension. We need to approach our conflict with a posture of humility and empathy. We have to be willing to understand other people's perspectives and motivations. We have to be able to look outside of our own experiences and opinions so that we can see the humanity between the person we're having struggle with. We have to be willing to place the other person in the relationship above ourselves. One of the most common deterrents to calming conflict is our pride. Pride keeps the focus on us and neglects understanding the perspective of anyone else involved. So when we approach conflict with a posture of humility, it puts the other person's needs First, and gives opportunity for us to find common ground with their afflictions, their fears, frustrations, and concerns. When we address or resolve our conflicts, are we considering the thoughts and the feelings of the other people in the situation over ourselves? Paul gives us instructions on how to calm the conflict, but what do we do when conflict continues to escalate? When it comes to a point of needing to be confronted, when conflict cannot be calmed, we have to confront it. And Jesus gives us a blueprint for that in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 17. He gives us a blueprint on how we can confront the conflict in the body of Christ that we experience. Matthew 18, verse 15 through 17 says this, If your brother or sister sins or sins against you, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. When conflict between us and our brothers and sister in Christ happens. Jesus says that the first thing we are to do is privately approach the person who sinned against us. But oh, how often is that not what we do? It's much easier, much more fun to go around. If conflict arises between us and someone else, we are instructed to first bring that issue before them, before we tell anyone else about it. And once the conflict is on the table, it gives us and that person the opportunity to talk through and potentially resolve the situation. Now, oftentimes, the primary source of conflict comes from miscommunication, whether that's a misunderstanding or a lack of willingness or ability to listen and speak up. When we make the effort in humility and empathy to share how we feel and open ourselves up to hearing how the other person 
is experiencing this conflict, there's a much greater chance for us to come to a place of resolution. But if by chance the issue does not get resolved, the second approach we're given is to confront that person with one or two others so that there are witnesses. When our conflict can't be resolved on our own, the wisdom we're given is to bring one or two other fellow believers or friends to help us settle the matter. This provides witnesses to the integrity behind our attempt to find resolution and restoration, but it also has the potential to communicate the gravity of the situation. It's like, no, this is bigger than you and me now. This is a big deal. If after trying both these approaches, there's still a refusal to resolve the issues being confronted, it says that the conflict should be presented to the leadership of the church. And the heart behind this is that the church would be able to help mediate, but also comfort and potentially resolve the conflict and bring about a positive solution. That we can give wisdom on how to deal with the situation in a biblical manner. It's the role of the church to be there for those in conflict. When we find ourselves in the midst of it, we can't seem to deal with it on our own. God has blessed us with the church to help us through and resolve our conflict. It's inevitable that we find ourselves at the center of conflict at one point or another, which is why in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus calls us to, to be uh, a peacemaker. He says, blessed are the peacemaker, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When we're in the midst of conflict, are we living into being that person that tries to calm it? Are we stirring the pot? Are we willing to refrain from retaliation? Remain above reproach? Reach for peace? Rely on God's wrath? And respond to evil with good? Are we willing to confront our conflict with a posture of humility and empathy in a way that honors God's word? Unresolved conflict leads to bitterness and broken relationships that tear up unity within the body of Christ. If any of us here today currently have a broken relationship due to unresolved conflict, my challenge for each and every one of us is to find a way to live into our calling this week in that relationship. When we address conflict and we resolve it in a healthy manner, we don't let the seeds of bitterness and brokenness take root in our lives and in the faith community that we have here at TFRC. We are called to calm the conflict, not cultivate it. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you for your word, for everything that it teaches us. And God, we thank you for its conviction. Lord, if there are conflicts happening in our lives right now, that are creating bitterness, brokenness, that are disrupting our lives. God, we pray that you would help us be above reproach in our attempt to try to resolve it. God, that you would give us peace, peace that allows for us to pursue being peacemakers. And that ultimately, God, if, if it moves to a place where we just need peace of mind, knowing we've done our best, that you would grant us that peace. Help us, Lord to be more and more like Jesus in our conduct and the way your word teaches us. Help us to be pursuers of peace and to calm the conflict in our lives. In your name we pray, amen. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be one of mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us as we pursue being peace bearers this week. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Have a great week, everyone.